On today's episode of The Arthropologist, I'm interviewing Max Miller with Tasting History. Hey, Max. Can you hear me? I can. Fantastic. How are you, sir? I am so well. I This is such a delight. We, my wife and I love your show. We are so, oh, Thank you. I'm so excited to talk to you because we've been following you. I think we've watched every one of your videos twice. And <laughs> great. Uh, just learn so much more every time we watch them again. So um, uh, let's just go ahead and get started. Um, you know, tell, every, tell everyone a little bit about your, your cooking show. Yeah, so it's, it's called Tasting History. Um, essentially, the, the goal is to explore history through the lens of food, whether it's the history of the food or uh, the history of the time period that the food comes from or uh, just a story associated with it. Um, and then we cook the food as well, and I teach you how to, how to make the food. And I try, for the most part, to use period recipes. It's not always, always possible because not always, recipes haven't always existed. So, um, but I try to use period recipes and then update them so you can make them in a modern kitchen. You know, you don't have to uh, necessarily have all of the accoutrement of a medieval kitchen or whatever you have. Right. Well, now I'm going to ask you a few questions that I obviously know the answer to, but uh, my viewers don't. Um, so you're not a trained chef, correct? I am not. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> well, you make amazing recipes. Um, so your love of history, your love of cooking, did they, did one come before the other or did they go hand in hand? What got you started with such an, a unique idea of history and cooking at the same time? Yeah. So my love of history definitely came first. I have loved history since, I mean, as far back as I, I can remember, I remember sitting with my grandpa who was a medic in World War II and just listening to him tell stories about his time in France and, and Germany um, near the end of the war. And I, I loved it so much. And, you know, to a kid in the late 80s, that was, that was history. You know, World War II was as far back as you could possibly go, as old as my grandparents. <laughs> now I don't even think of it as that long ago. But um, back then, that was history. But it was the way that my grandfather told the stories. It was history through storytelling. And, and that was what got me interested in history. And, and granted, I, I, also, I also love kind of the drier history books out there. Um, but I still always gravitate to, <clears throat> excuse me, to the stories uh, that history can teach us. Like I said, since I was a little kid, um, I didn't start cooking until about six five or six years ago i i didn't cook at all my my father was always my mom cooked but my father was always the the one who had a passion for food growing up um but i never really i never really learned from him he um uh never really taught me how to cook and so i didn't know i never cooked anything until i got to be uh well, like I said, about six years ago, when I watched the Great British Bake Off for the first time, we were, I was with my friend uh, Maureen in, at Disney World for uh, New Year's, and she got sick. And so basically, we spent the entire vacation in our hotel room. We, we would go to the park for like an hour and then have to go back to the hotel room because she didn't feel well. And what it let, let us have time to do was watch the entire an entire season of the Great British Bake Off, and I was entranced. I just thought that it was fantastic, especially um, in those older seasons, they had little sections that were about the history of whatever they were baking. The two hosts, Mel and Sue, would, would talk about, um, you know, the history of, they, they did the Sally Lund bun, or the history of, uh, I think they did black licorice, and, and all sorts of different things. and. I loved that, and they they got rid of that unfortunately um but as soon as I got back from from that vacation, I started baking uh because the show had it it had just given me something that other cooking shows didn't 
give me. You know, so many American cooking shows, it's like, okay, you, we want you to bake, uh, make a cupcake, but it has to have squid ink and here's, you know, and you have to do it in 30 minutes, you know. And so it's cool to watch, but it's, it's not very appetizing all the time. But everything in the Great British Bake Off, for the most part, is something that I want to eat. So I tried baking and that's, that's how it started, you know. Well, fantastic. One thing uh, I noticed right off the bat was your revolving set of um, stuffed animals with <laughs> every episode. It was a new stuffed animal and I see all of them on your bed. So that is just, have you just got this huge stuffed animal collection? You know what? I, I do not. I have almost none. I have a few Disney um, plush stuffed animals back at work and I'm not allowed to get go back to my, my work right now, it's um, closed down. But, uh, so I have a few, but this collection here, and you can't even see it, it extends around. This is not our bedroom. This is our second bedroom for the cats. <laughs> so we're not having to clear those off, but those are my fiancés. Uh, he has a passion for Pokemon and just a lot of them. And I've always kind of uh, gently ridiculed him, you know, for, it, and then it turns out that on the show they're more popular than I am. I mean, <laughs> well, I will tell you, I will tell you, I noticed that, but I also noticed that you've got at least, I'm guessing, six or seven different aprons. And my favorite, my favorite is the one with the, um, oh, it's not hieroglyphics, but it's it's got. The, yes, yes, I love that one. So the Bayou Tapestry is my favorite piece of art. I have read everything about it. And I, I, I'm just obsessed with the Bayou Tapestry and the story and the time period that goes along with it. There's, there is no greater piece of art in my, in my opinion. Um, and I have blankets and, and I have it up on our wall above our bed and I have it everywhere. So for my birthday this year, my mom uh, had that made. And with, because it has the scene from the Bayou Tapestry uh, of William, Duke William then, or William the Conqueror, um, sitting down to his first meal once he reaches England. And uh, so it's, it's kind of perfect for the show, you know? Yeah. Um, you've mentioned your library a number of times. Do you have a pretty extensive library? <clears throat> I do. Um, it's, it's kind of all around me at the moment. Again, you can't see it, but... Um, it's, it's a fair number of books. A lot of the things that I have that are more history-based, I have on Kindle, um, unless they're things that were never available on Kindle, which, which does happen. And they tend to be wildly expensive and, and um, little treats that I've got myself or, or people have got me throughout the years. But I do have a pretty extensive library. The nice thing is when it comes to old cookbooks specifically, so much of it is online. Um, so I don't physically have a lot of the things that I cook from. Um, namely, you can't even get a physical copy unless you just printed it, printed it out. But um, there are things like the, the um, Gutenberg Project and different museums and different universities and libraries have digitized these old cookbooks that they have. And in many cases, um, translated them into modern day English, which is always a help. Um, and so, you know, you can just go online. You kind of have to know what you're looking for to a certain degree. But it's like once you get in, then, then it's a rabbit hole. Then you'll find things that you weren't looking for and, and links. And, and there's, there's so much out there. Uh, it's, it's, it's nice. It's well, on your show, have you followed your analytics at all? Do you know if most of your fans tend to be uh, – male or female or, or what part of the country or what part of the world they come from? Yeah, so um, my, my fan base is, is largely male. Um, what's nice is that, because when I first started out, most, most of the way that I was sharing my videos, this was back in March and April, uh, most of the way that I was sharing my videos was via um, Reddit, which is a very male heavy audience in general. So it made sense that my audience was at that time like 85% male, 15% female. And it always kind of discouraged me because I was like, do women not like history? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but as soon as YouTube has started kind of being the one to push out the videos rather than my 
sharing them to specific places, the, the number has started to, um, to, to gain a little equilibrium. It's still heavily male. Um, I think it's about 65, 35. So, um, but I, 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 every, every time that I see that female um, number ratchet up, I'm like, good. I, I don't know why, because it, it, was, it was just discouraging. I was like, what, what is it about me that they don't like? Right. Well, I will tell you, my wife, uh, she's old school. She's got a degree in home economics. So uh, she is a tremendous cook, a tremendous baker. And so lots of times when you're doing things, I will actually ask her because she, she actually knows the science behind a lot of cooking. Uh, but she loves it. And then the both of us love history. So it's just such a wonderful melding of our two passions. Uh, but I was going to ask you, okay, now your detective work. So you're, you're hunting down these recipes from ancient history. Where are most of your sources coming from? Are you going through mostly the computer? I mean, obviously now with COVID, but before then, were you going to old bookstores, conventions? I mean, I don't know. Um, mostly it was, so it, it kind of all started with a book actually that I have here called To the King's Taste, which I've had for, for years. And it's by uh, Lorna J. Sass. And I think it's from the 70s, I want to say. And she took a bunch of medieval recipes, namely from the, um, either the Harleian manuscripts or the, uh, the form of curry and a few others. And and modernize them for the American or for the for the modern kitchen, and that. But but the wonderful thing is that she includes the original recipes as well, which a lot of a lot of cookbooks that modernize old recipes don't include the original recipe. So you're like, is this, you know, how close is this? You have no way of telling because a lot of times the way that they modernize them, they completely change them, um, which sometimes is necessary but sometimes it's kind of like well why did you leave this ingredient out it's a fairly common ingredient and they don't put any reasoning behind those changes so that's one reason why why i'm doing the show um but in that book it told me some primary sources i googled the sources i started getting those primary sources and there is a wonderful part of books um in books that people usually never read and it's called the bibliography Right. And if you go to a history on a food bibliography, you're going to find all of these primary sources. You're just, just going to find a list. Um, there's, there's a wonderful, um, there are several books, I'm trying to look, look around here, uh, that I have on, on the history of English cooking um, that, you know, you just go to the bibliography and there's a list of 50 primary sources that then you can look up. And that leads you to a history of, of all food book. And then you go to that bibliography and now you've got things from China and India and, and, you know, ancient Rome and everything. Now, when it comes to the ancient, anything before Apicius, um, which, which is, you know, fourth century Rome, um, anything before that collection of recipes, it's very hard to, because they're not really recipes. I just did an episode on, on Kikion, uh, which is an ancient Greek potion, that they call it, that was served um, in a number of different places. It was kind of a medicinal thing, uh, but it's mentioned in the Iliad and the Odyssey, and Homer doesn't give a recipe. He gives the ingredients, maybe not all of them, um, he gives the ingredients and you know you from other sources you get an idea of how it's supposed to to look and taste but but there are so many sources that disagree with each other and that's the thing people are like well no this it's supposed to be like this yes no you don't know you weren't there because one source says one thing another source says another thing it's it's all a bit of detective work in it and at a certain point you kind of have to just say this is my version I'm using these resources. This is my version. If somebody else made a different video, it would probably be different, and that's okay. Just like if you were to make a um, a lasagna now, your lasagna is going to be different from 
someone else's lasagna is going to be different from a restaurant's lasagna, going to be different from lasagna in Italy, you know? And it's the same thing with, with historic foods, especially when we don't have an exact recipe. Right. Now, uh, we really enjoyed your bread pudding uh, episode, and we found it fascinating that it came, the recipe came from a Civil War hospital manual. So you were talking about, now that's not a place where you would expect to find a recipe. Are there other sort of hidden away places where uh, you found in the literature or whatever you found recipes or others have found recipes where they go, oh my goodness, I would never have thought of that. Yeah, um, definitely. And honestly, I don't know that I would have ever found that recipe if it hadn't been for the um, the Museum of Civil War Medicine reaching out to me and saying, hey, there's this book that has some cool Civil War recipes. We'd love to help you do some research and everything. Because I wouldn't, I would have never opened up the hospital stewards manual to, um, to find anything, honestly. <laughs> but uh, so one, one way that I found a lot of things is by people sending me stuff and, and, and saying, hey, in this epic from ancient Greece, they talk about this dish. You would never find it if you just Googled, you know, ancient Greek recipe. It's, it's not going to come up. But somebody had read it and said, hey, they mention it. Um, it was kind of the same with the, my last episode was on an Indian dish called the Manosalasa. Um, the dish is called Payasam, but the, the book that it came from is called the Manosalasa. Well, the Manosalasa is a medieval Indian text on um, daily life in the royal court. And it's all, you know, most of it is on politics and uh, medicine and veteran, you know, being, uh, taking care of animals, veterinary medicine, I guess, um, and music and dancing and all of these other things. But then there's this one little slice of it that is about food. I wouldn't have found that if if I hadn't necessarily kind of had my eyes open for for other things. So I I tend to I like to research history in general, and then you find you find things through that. So you're not necessarily you can't have your blinders on and just looking for recipes because you're not going to find them um, because there weren't cookbooks until relatively recently. You know, the last eight hundred years or so. So what is the oldest recipe that we know of? Well, that's kind of a, a good question. Um, Cause what is, a, again, what is a recipe? Is a recipe just a list of ingredients? Cause if that's the case, then it's actually um, on, it's probably for a, a lamb stew that was written in cuneiform on an old Sumerian uh, tablet. But it's not really a recipe it's you know it's a it's just a list of ingredients and and a vague description of a dish and that's kind of what we see until fairly far down the road um you know apicius is kind of the first cookbook from from the west at least um and that's the 4th century that 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 was compiled um though some of the recipes might be as early as the 1st century um you know, and, and if even then, you might not consider it a recipe. Uh, you might not even consider things in many things in the form of curry to be a recipe because today, for a recipe, we need to not only know the ingredients, we need to know how much of things are being put in, and we need to know what to do with those ingredients. Um, you know, are, are you mixing everything together and baking it? Is that there, there's so much open open to interpretation. So really, when you first start seeing solid recipes is the late medieval, early Renaissance, when they start kind of putting that stuff in. And even then, it's not consistent until the late 19th century. Wow. So what's the oldest Very recipe, or what's the oldest recipe that you have personally prepared? Kikion, uh, the, that ancient Greek recipe. But again, it's a recipe. It's a list of four ingredients with a couple other ingredients that I ended up not using because they're not consistently listed. So um, 
Yeah, that's the, okay. that's the oldest dish that I've made, whether you consider it a recipe or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, you know, table manners and just ma manners in general, that t manners tend to go along with eating and they're, they're sort of uh, melded together. Um, do you have much knowledge of, of the history of how our table manners evolved over time? So I, I know a bit, but I actually just ordered a book all on the history of, of manners throughout the world, um, because they're very different. If you go to, um, you know, I, Iran or, or Japan or South America or the Philippines, you know, everywhere is very, very different what they consider to be, to be polite and, and not. Um, so I'm still learning about that. I actually want to do at least one episode on, on manners. I, I feel like I could probably do a few, um, especially I, I, I touched just a bit on the, when I, when I did my episode on the form of curry, because I talked about, uh, King Richard II and it was his court in the late 1300s in England that started to codify some of what we consider manners today whether they were already in place before or not, he was the one that kind of brought them together and made them, made them the staple of the, of the English court. Uh, things like using a napkin, he kind of came up with the idea or is credited with coming up with the idea of the handkerchief, having something to wipe your mouth on other than your sleeve. Um, and he, you know, no, no belching at the table, wash your hands before coming to dinner, no putting your elbows on the table. But then there are also ideas that, that the no putting your elbows on a table had to do with the fact that tables were typically in the, in the Middle Ages, not a fixed piece of furniture. It was trellis uh, or tresses with a board on it that would then be moved to the side of the room because that one room then had to be used for dancing or you know, congregating and holding the court later on. So everything kind of had to move. So if you put your elbows on a piece of wood that is just kind of balancing on, on two, uh, uh, two other pieces of wood, um, tresses, is that the word that I'm looking for? Tress, it's like, I think that's the word that I'm looking for. Um, you know, the, the table's gonna flip over. So. Sometimes manners came from necessity, uh, we think. Yeah, um, just uh, thinking about when you're ta talking about your recipes, you tend to uh, talk in, in terms of grams instead of cups and uh, spoonfuls or whatever. Do you do okay. grams just because it's more accurate? So I, it's funny because I, I have always cooked via grams and milliliters because I started watching the Great British Bake Off. That's what got me into cooking. And so that's what they use. And it is so much more accurate, especially in baking. It's, it's very important in baking, um, less so in cooking. I have tried to start having both metric and American um, measurements uh, because I do have so many Americans watching. Um, probably more, more than half of my audience is American. Um, and not everyone has a, a kitchen scale, but sometimes it's very hard to, to, to get away from that. So I, 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 I'm not consistent. I'm trying to be more consistent. Um, but I do always try to include both. Um, okay. yeah, if, if you don't have a scale, you should get one because they're really helpful in the kitchen. <laughs> Yeah, well, you've, you've talked uh, uh, back and forth about baking and cooking. Um, do you prefer cooking over baking, or do you find one harder or more easy than the other? Or I, I prefer baking. Um, and I, I feel like it's – baking to me is like I – don't, I don't know if you watch Harry Potter, but Snape, when he's talking about potion work, is um, in the incredibly precise – art of making potions. That's what I think of when I think of baking. It is an art that can, that can be messed up very, very easily because you didn't weigh something right, because the temperature was not exactly where it needed to be, um, or something wasn't chilled long enough. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that preciseness. I like working from a recipe. 
when I'm cooking and I'm actually doing an episode right now with a historian who I'm um, obsessed with. Uh, and he, he's, he's cooking something. And I said, well, what's, what's the recipe? And he's like, I'm just going to, you know, use the ingredients and, and see what happens. I'm like, no, I can't do that. So it's just, I know that, that it's important to be able to kind of eyeball stuff, but I'm not always good at it. And it's interesting because he, so there, there's a book called Fanny Farmer's Boston. Uh, I actually have it here. Let me get the name exactly right. The Boston Cooking School. Book, book of Cookery, I think. It, anyway, it's Fanny Farmer's book from the late 1800s. And she's kind of credited with the idea of precise measurements um, in, in cookbooks, leveling off a, a cup or a teaspoon and making sure that everything was exact. So her format for a recipe, excuse me, her format for a recipe is basically what we still see in cookbooks today. And I love that, but um, this, this person that I'm working with, uh, he, he basically said, you know, he kind of blames her for people becoming stuck on recipes, becoming too dependent on recipes and, and kind of losing that idea of, I'm just gonna pour some wine in here and, and throw a little bit of this in there until I see the right consistency. Um, I'm still learning that, that, that art, because it is an art. Cooking is an art. Um, so I on, love the recipe. <laughs> <laughs> on making your show, do you have a crew? Do you have some people helping you? Because you've got really nice production values okay. with your motion graphics and uh, your lighting, your camera work is just really well done. And I was just curious, you know, how long it takes on average to do a show and do you have people helping you? So I don't have people helping me except for um, my fiance does the, well, he always picks the Pokemon who will go in the back. And he also helps with the subtitles um, because basically by the time that I upload a video, I'm so done with it that <laughs> he's gracious enough to go in and, and do all the subtitles. Um, so everything else is just me. And it's been an incredibly steep learning curve because I didn't know anything about camera work or, um, or lighting or, or anything like that. And it's a lot harder than I expected it to be. I, you'll see in my early episodes and even, even until fairly recently, um, sometimes my eyes look really, really red or I have a yellowish tint to my skin. And it's because one, I'm colorblind, so I'm, I'm not always sure what I'm looking at. And two, the camera settings, um, I, I couldn't figure out how to get rid of the, the red around my eyes that makes it look like I've been smoking marijuana, even though I haven't. Um, uh, recently, I figured out the settings, I'm figuring out the lighting, but still not quite consistently. Um, and so that has been a big learning curve. And then the editing has been a fairly steep learning curve. The nice thing is, you know, I come from a performing background. And so telling a story and figuring out the arc of a story is not foreign to me. And I, and I try to make every episode kind of have an arc, even in the history. It's not just a, an info dump of facts. It's, you know, there's, there's kind of a thesis, if you will to the history portion. Um, and then I, in my, in my old job, I was working closely with a lot of some of the best editors in the world, uh, working on trailers for Walt Disney Studios. So um, even though I was not editing anything, I think being able to see their process, I, I picked up some of, some of the pacing and, and, and that kind of stuff. That said, I'm still really slow at it. And once the episode is, so kind of the part of the episode that can really take all sorts of amounts of time are the, the research. It can take a few hours. It can take two weeks, um, you know, it, depending on how familiar I already am with the history or whatever. Um, so that is, is variable. Then 
the actual writing of the script takes a couple days. The filming takes usually a full day uh, for mo in most cases, about four to six hours. And then the editing can take me anywhere from eight to 20 hours, depending on how intricate it is. That's the part of the process that I eventually, fairly soon, hopefully can give over to someone else. Um, but because it, it's a full time job and I'm only able to do it, I think, full time because I'm furloughed from my my other job. But as soon as I go back, I'm going to have to figure out how to how to balance both projects. Right. Um, well, tell me, what's the worst cooking disaster that you've you've experienced? And that can be for your show or uh, just on your own. So I think the worst the worst disaster that I ever experienced there were two and they happened almost simultaneously. I, I think one was one weekend and one was the next weekend. The first was I made a, um, I found a recipe for rose apple pie. And so I made this rose apple pie and it smelled amazing. Um, and then we went to taste it and it was like putting, like putting potpourri in your mouth. It was God awful. And it was because I did not then know the difference that there was a difference between rose water and rose oil. And so when it called for two teaspoons of rose water and I used two teaspoons of rose oil, which is like a hundred times more potent, it was just awful, but it made the apartment smell, smell wonderful for days. The next weekend I ended up making this wonderfully intricate top for a blueberry pie. Um, I, I made out of the dough, I made vines and leaves and it was gorgeous. And I put it into the oven and it, it came out, pie was done. It was wonderful, but the top had not really browned as much as I would have liked. So I decided I'll put the broiler on, but just for, just for a little bit, you know, just to kind of brown it. But what is a little bit? Uh, I put it in for two minutes. I thought that would be, you know, it, I think 10 seconds enough because the house filled with smoke and the pie was completely burnt to a crisp in two minutes. So those are my two biggest disasters, I think. And I've had many others. Uh, a lot of the things that I make end up in the trash. Um, but that's, that's part of the, part of the process. Are you into gadgets? Do you have a lot of cooking gadgets? I have way too many because my kitchen, I don't know if you've noticed, can notice from the, um, from the videos is tiny. And uh, that's why I don't film in my kitchen. Uh, I film making the food from the top down in my kitchen, but I can't actually film myself because there's not room for me and the camera in the kitchen. Um, it's tiny. So I have a lot of gadgets, but they are everywhere. Uh, the kitchen is packed as well as uh, this closet here to my side has a fair number of baking sheets and baking pans and uh, pasta making things and you know a lot of things that I've only used once or twice which is always disappointing <laughs> but but I love them so much I could never get rid of them. I was wondering is there one you're embarrassed to let anybody know you have but you couldn't live without it? <laughs> um, <clears throat> embarrassed? I don't think there's any I don't think there are any embarrassed. Of, I, definitely some some of the baking pans that I have are I wouldn't say I'm embarrassed but are nerdy. Um, Mostly things that my fiance has got, you know, my Captain America shield baking pan, and uh, I have a baking pan in the shape of Pikachu, who's a Pokemon. Um, so not embarrassed, but probably will never make a, uh, you know, an appearance on Tasting History. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk to you about your kitchen. You know, you're talking about it being small, and uh, my wife, of course, has her dream kitchen. Tell me yours. A dream kitchen, you know, <clears throat> sometimes I, I would love to have like a, a, a huge medieval style kitchen, but I think practically speaking, I would love to have a, a nice big kind of English countryside style kitchen with a range um, and a, a big kitchen island. I need a big kitchen island and I want the stove to be in the kitchen island. Uh, that's, that's something I, I really need, especially for filming this show. It'd be nice to be able to film while I'm cooking. Um, and then another thing I want, and I don't think I'll ever get, is a massive fireplace in the kitchen, big enough to have a cauldron 
or, uh, you know, have a, a small, a small roasting pig or something. I don't need an ox size, but, but something like that, a hearth, I guess it would be, not even a fireplace, a hearth. Um, that's mm -hmm. what I want. I don't know that it'll ever happen. <laughs> <laughs> gas or electric? Are you a gas or electric guy? I'm a gas guy. Uh, I, I, I prefer it. I, I feel that there's just a lot more... Um, you have more control over exactly what you're getting um, as far as temperature goes. And that's just for, for the um, stove. I, I don't, I've never had anything but a gas oven, so I, I can't say which, which I prefer when it comes to that. Um, I do, my, my parents have a, an electric oven that is flat and it looks gorgeous, but you never know if the, <laughs> If it's hot or not, and I'm always so afraid of it. <laughs> right, right. My wife is; she can't stand electric because she. You, that's where she says you don't know what the temperature really is, and you can control yeah. that flame. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about you know? Obviously, nonstick wasn't around back in the past, but do you prefer iron or copper? And what historically is have people used un up until recent times? Was it mostly copper, mostly iron? Entirely sure. And, you know, it kind of depends on, on where you are in the world. Um, I think that, that iron was, was the, main, the main cooking vessel um, for most of history, whether it be an iron cauldron or an iron, uh, uh, you know, pots and, and pans and everything. I think copper is, I don't know. I don't know when copper pots and stuff, I, I, I imagine they're very old, but I imagine they're extremely expensive or were extremely, still are extremely expensive. So I don't know who would have been cooking with those except for, you know, the wealthy. I went to a, um, it's kind of a replica of, well, not a replica, it is an 18th century townhouse in Bath. Um, in the Royal Crescent area, and they have they have maintained the kitchen. They basically they had walled off the kitchen long, long ago. And some years back, they knocked down that wall and went in, and everything was exactly the way that it was whenever they had walled it off. You know, 150 or 200 years before. Sorry if you can hear the um, construction outside. I apologize. Um, but so they have all of these everything from the kitchens of the day and almost all of the pots and pans were copper, but this was a very, very nice uh, home for the wealthy. So, so that would make sense. Now when it comes to nonstick, I, I rarely use nonstick. Um, I prefer my, my stainless steel uh, all clad pots and pans. I think that they, they work very well, but there are some things that I do use the nonstick for. I know that it's it's supposedly not good for you, but sometimes sometimes it just makes life so much easier. <laughs> I'm like, there's so many things that aren't good for me. I can I can do this grilled cheese on a nonstick. Well, now you talk a lot about herbs and spices. Um, is there so, a, a few herbs and spices that you just for your, at least for your own personal use that you just couldn't live without? Cardamom. I could not live without cardamom. I was first introduced to cardamom when I, I worked at an Indian, it was an Indian restaurant in, in Soho in New York City. I can't remember what it was that we even sold, but it was, it was a specific food that we sold. I cannot remember what it was. It was a drink though. And, um, and it had cardamom in it. And I just remember the first time that I tasted it, I was blown away as the most delicious, fragrant flavor I'd ever have. And from then on, it is my number one ingredient in my, in my cabinet. And I'm always adding it to things that you wouldn't think would be added. Like my chocolate chip cookies have a little bit of cardamom in there. And so people are always like, what is that flavor? And I'm not gonna tell you, it's cardamom. Uh, so, <laughs> so, spoiler. <laughs> but I, so that's my, that's my number one. And then when it comes to herbs, I love, um, I love dill. I think dill is a fantastic flavor that isn't used nearly as often as it should be because it can be a little overpowering, but I love it. Well, what about, I know in a couple of your episodes, you've talked about that you 
would use this spice, but it's almost impossible to get um, because it's localized to a, a region in the, of the world, um, or it's just so expensive that there's no way you could use it. But is there some of that that if it weren't so expensive or hard to get, that that would be a go-to spice or herb for you as well? Um, you know what? And it, it's funny. When I did the episode on hypocrites, I used a lot of spices I had never gotten before and, and were expensive. The reason, part of the reason that they were so hard to get was because when I ordered them, it was the end of March. I don't know if you remember the end of March, but there were no stores open. There were right. no, Amazon was not shipping anything that was not essential. So I couldn't get these spices that honestly I could get. We have in LA, we have some wonderful spice stores that, that have these weird spices, um, but I couldn't get them. So that's one reason why they were so difficult to find. But there are certain spices that are just very difficult to, to get or they're expensive. One that I'm excited to use, and I've never used it, and I don't know that it's actually a spice. A lot of people consider it an herb, but it's called, and I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, asafetida. Um, and it's, uh, it came from like the area around Persia and was very popular in um, Byzantine and, and ancient Roman cooking. And, and even now is, is often used instead of silphium because silphium was a very popular herb in ancient Rome, but it's unfortunately most likely extinct. Uh, we don't really even know what it was, but what scientists think it was is, is extinct. Um, so I'm excited to, to try that. I just got it yesterday. Um, so I've never tasted it. So that is something I'll be doing this weekend. I'm very excited. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I had this question for a little bit further down the road, but since you brought it up, I was going to ask, I'm looking at my questions here. Um, are there spices or I guess it'd be more spices, maybe herbs that either we believe are extinct or they just completely fallen out of favor or we don't even know what they are. There'll, there'll be a name there, obviously, but nobody really knows what that means. Uh, so do you run into recipes where there's stuff that it's either nobody knows what that is or we do, but it's extinct? Yeah. Um, the big one is sylphium. That's, that's probably the most, um, the most gut wrenching, uh, that we don't, that we don't know what it is. And off the top of my head, I know that there are others, but off the top of my head, I can't think what they are. A lot of times what you find is disagreement um, between historians or translators because they'll be translating an old word and, and say, well, this is supposed to be this. Somebody else says, no, it's supposed to be this. And one of those is, is a common spice now. And one of those is a spice that, you know, is mentioned in old writings, but, but we don't know what it was. So a lot of times that's the issue is, is that we don't really know even what they were referring to. It could have been something that we have now. It could have not. And it's, it's all a bit of a guessing game. Um, there are also things like, it's not a spice, but um, I'm making a recipe this weekend that calls for something called um, Ruyan cheese. Uh, I think it's R-U-Y-A-N. And it's mentioned several times in medieval cookbooks, especially from England and France. Um, and nobody really knows what it is. A lot of people think that it's a type of cheese that was made after the second, the second harvest, something like that. It's, it's late fall cheese that has, that's semi-soft and has like a pungent flavor. Some people think that it's actually a very hard aged cheese. So it's, it's like nobody knows. And there's probably no book that we will ever find that gives a contemporary example of how to make it or exactly what it was. So it's, it's, it's things like that that are always like, ah, I'm guessing it's this. I could be wrong. Right. You know, well, this is, this is sort of, I guess you'd have to make some conjecture, but in your research, are there some foods that people in ancient times uh, that they eat, it could be spices, herbs, whatever, that modern people would just probably not be able to stomach and vice versa. And I'm not necessarily talking about anything with a moral grounding, 
uh, I'm, I'm just talking about like Australians today don't care for peanut butter. They eat uh, Vegemite. Most Americans aren't going to eat Vegemite. Right. So is there something that the ancient Greeks just loved that modern people would go, yuck, we just can't stomach that. I think, I think a big thing is um, innards, uh, awful. Um, o F F A L. Uh, you know, you can still find restaurants that'll serve sweet breads. And in England, they have, of course, blood pudding or black pudding. Um, but rare do you find people that cook with blood uh, anymore. And I mean, there are, there are a lot of religious reasons um, associated with that, of course. There are also, you know, when you say, because like you said, you know, Australians feel one way and, and we feel another way. Brains. I, I don't cook with brains, but a lot of cultures cook with brains and, and heart and, you know, all of these other pieces of meat that Americans tend to probably go to dog food. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with eating heart. It's, I don't really like, I have eaten it. I don't really like it because it does tend to be very, very tough um, because of the nature of that muscle. There are probably ways of cooking it though that, that make it less, less so. And I just haven't had those. Um, but it's like, I had sweet breads once. I was turned off because they weren't cooked well. I never went back. And then a couple years ago at a wonderful French restaurant in New York, I had sweetbreads again. And I was like, oh, this is what they're supposed to taste like. So yes, um, but those were cooked with a lot back then because you just, until very recently, you could not afford to waste food. That was unbelievable. It's one reason why in the Middle Ages and, and before they used trenchers which were, you know, slices of, of bread that you, in, that you used instead of a plate. It was because either if bread had gone stale, you weren't going to throw it out, you were going to use it as a plate. Or if the bottom of the bread had, you know, on, in old wood-fired ovens, the bottom would tend to get burned and then the top would be fine. So you had the bottom crust and then the upper crust. The upper crust was the nice uh, bread and then the bottom crust tended to be kind of gross and so that would be turned into a trencher. You just did not waste food um, which is probably a thing we should kind of bring back into <laughs> into <laughs> culture but uh, well you know. I, I know the answer I think I know the answer to this because we just watched the episode but um, what's the recipe you made that you like the least of all that you've made? <laughs> Kiki on. There you go. Yeah. Um, again, maybe I didn't do it the way that it was done, but I, I did it pretty much how it's described in, in the writings. And it's just, what's interesting is it's all flavors that you would think would go well together. Because if you get a cheese plate today, you, you have your cheese, maybe a little bit of honey, and then some crackers that could be made out of barley, perhaps, and then a nice glass of wine. Those are all of the ingredients. How could that be bad? Turns out when you mix them all together, and it wasn't even the flavor that was bad, it was the texture. It was because it was just like gloopy oatmeal that shouldn't, but the flavor did not match oatmeal. <laughs> so it was this, it was that weird juxtaposition of, oh, this isn't, this is not right. <laughs> this is yeah, not something I want. This was, that was such a funny episode. And we had to give you kudos because you, you tried it and then you tried it one more time just to see, is it really this bad? And yeah, apparently it was really that bad. Yeah. It just wasn't great. It wasn't okay. Great. It was and then, and then what was your favorite recipe of all that you've made? My favorite recipe. And I, and I have a couple. Um, one was the Sally Lunn bun. Um, it's, it's just a bread that is just, I mean, it's like a brioche. It's just so heavenly and delicious, and I love bread. Um, the other one was actually the episode that, excuse me, that I just put out, Ayasam from medieval England, or uh, sorry, medieval India. Um, it's, it's a rice pudding that has cardamom. Uh, I hate cardamom, so, you know, I, I'm going to like that. But it was so sweet and simple and not heavy. It, it was 
very different from a rice pudding that I would uh, typically have here in America or in, in Mexico, um, where I had a lot of rice pudding. Um, but it was, it was really lovely. So that's, that's one of my favorites as well. Yeah. Yeah. And my wife loves bread puddings. I have only had one that I cared for. I'm not a big bread pudding fan, but after watching that, it was very intriguing. I was thinking, you know, that would be an interesting one to try because you really seem to enjoy that, be sold on that quite a bit. Here's one question that I've really been intrigued about. Listening to you as you're reading from some of these manuscripts, you seem to read uh, French, Italian, Middle, Old English, and Latin very well. You're not stumbling over words or, you know, really butchering them. So do you actually know all of these languages? No. Um, I know, I know a little bit of German. Um, I can get around in France. I know a little bit of, of, uh, Italian, but the reason that I'm able to read them so, so, so well is I, in a past life in, in, in at college and then actually still, I still do, but, uh, my degree is in classical voice. So when you get a degree in, in classical singing, singing opera especially, you know, opera tends to be written in the, the main three languages are French, German, and Italian. So you take classes, not just in learning the languages, which you do, but you take classes simply in the, about the pronunciation of the words. So if you, because if, if then you go on to a career in opera, you might be tasked to go sing, you know, a role in Die Gitte Dämmerung, in Germany. And if you're pronouncing the German words like an American would pronounce, you know, guten tag, you can't say that if you're in Germany performing. So you have to be able to pronounce the words. Am I perfect? Heck no. <laughs> but it's mainly because college was a little while ago. But I do feel like I, you know, I, I remember enough of it. Um, and I've always had a, a good ear for pronunciation and language. When it comes to Latin, it's funny because I tend to pronounce things um, in what's, what's often known as uh, liturgical Latin or church Latin because the music that I was singing was, of course, liturgical Latin, but that is pronounced differently than um, classical Latin. Uh, so, you know, in, in liturgical Latin, it would be apicius, and it's apicius in, or apicius in um, classical Latin. And there's, there's even debate over, over which one is right. And if you go to Germany, then everything is pronounced different. So, uh, you know, but it's a dead language. So who really cares? Right. right. <laughs> um, um, we, you know, looking here, I've got one, really one last question that I was thinking about. Uh, it sounds like you've traveled quite a bit. Um, once COVID is over, where are some of the places you want to go back to? So I love traveling. If I could do anything, I would travel nine months out of the year. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite things, learning new cultures, meeting people um, who, you know, don't think like me. Uh, I, I want to go back to England. I always want to go back to England. England is my favorite place in the world. So I want to go back to England and I want to do uh, Scotland and, and do some, maybe some episodes actually there. I would also really like to do Spain. I've never been to Spain and uh, the cuisine there is so interesting and has such an amazing history because of the influence from the Moors uh, and on the lower Iberian Peninsula. It just has, it, it's so different than anything else that you'll find in Europe. Um, and I'd like to go uh, to Japan. Jose has always wanted to go to Japan. So someday we will go to Japan. It's my fiance. Um, we will, we will go to Japan and, and study the cuisine and history there. Have you been to some places that you don't want to go back to, or not necessarily that they're a bad place, but I can't remember, but I think it was like Andrew Zimmern, if you're familiar with him. <laughs> Excuse me, we follow him. And I think there have been a few places that were really rough. I mean, lots of bugs, lots of heat. There was, he would say, okay, I'm glad I went, but I don't want to go back. So are there places that either you really wouldn't want to necessarily go, or if you did, you'd only want to do it once? Yeah, parts of Florida, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever want to 
go back to. Um, the humidity kind of got me. And it's like, uh, the culture isn't enough to outweigh the humidity. Um, though there are also parts of Florida that I absolutely love. So, um, no, you know, China. I, I've been to Beijing and I don't have a strong desire to go back during the summer because I hate the heat um, intensely. I don't know why I live in Los Angeles, but I, I, I think if I was ever to go back to China, um, at least that part of China, it would need to be in the late fall, you know, maybe a, a dusting of, of snow or something. Um, there, but I don't, I've never found a place where I'm like, I don't, I don't need to go back there. Um, I've, I've found something that I love in every place that I've ever visited, whether it be the culture or the history, or more often than not, it's it's the people that are living there today and their unique perspective um, that's different from mine. And that, that's my favorite way to learn is by actually meeting people who, who just think differently and, and know different things. Right, right. Well, before we wrap it up, is there anything else you'd like to share about your show uh, to my viewers that would hopefully get turned on to your show? I don't know. I mean, <clears throat> definitely if you, if you like history and you don't mind it being taken a little bit lightly and, and having some, uh, having some fun with it, then I think that my show is, is good for that. If you, if you take things very seriously then maybe it's you want to stay away from because it's, it's serious history, but, but I tend to, to have fun with it. Um, and if you do watch and you do make any of the things that uh, I have on there, I love it when people post on Twitter or Instagram um, and share those with me or just hashtag tasting history. I love to see people making the dishes. It's my favorite part. Okay. And share with everyone uh, your, your website, your Instagram, Twitter, just tell everybody where to find everything about you. So YouTube, it's, it's youtube.com forward slash tasting history. Very easy. Uh, for Twitter, it's tasting history one, the number one. And Instagram is uh, tasting history with Max Miller. Okay. Max, this has been so much fun. We like I said, we've watched, I think, every episode of your show twice. Love it. And I've looked so forward to talking to you. Thank you for being on my show. Thank you, Bill. It's good talking to you. I love the art behind you, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, this is this has been a delight. I'm Bill Wilson, and I'm the Arthropologist. If you've enjoyed this episode of The Arthropologist, please hit the like button. And if you'd like to see more episodes like this, think about subscribing. I'm Bill